Welcome to the FCICA product webinar series. We are pleased to have Sean Leahy of Sika Corporation with us today. Sean, the floor is yours. Thanks, Lizzie. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Leahy. I'm the uh, Eastern Regional Manager of Sika. And today we're going to be talking uh, mainly about moisture mitigation. Uh, you see the cover slide there uh, talking about the Sika Secure system, which we'll get into towards the end. Start with, uh, obviously, I have an agenda to give you an idea of what we're going to discuss here on the webinar. Uh, where does moisture come from? Why do we test for moisture? Why is it important? Uh, what to check for on job sites? How to identify moisture content? And how to solve moisture issues? Uh, I know Bill in the beginning talked a little bit about Q&A. We'll have a Q&A session at the end, so if you want to um, ask questions then, you can as well. Uh, but we'll get right into it here uh, with some of these agenda items so that we can start moving along. Uh, where does moisture come from? When we talk about that, we're talking specifically about concrete. Obviously, we know that on job sites, one of the main issues uh, that floor, floor covering installers face and contractors face is moisture on job. And traditionally, what they're talking about in terms of flooring is moisture coming up from the slab. Uh, so when we talk about where moisture comes from, we talk about it in terms of coming from concrete. If you look at concrete, you have uh, basically five components. You have the cement, you have the sand, you have the aggregate, which gives it the body. You have 6% of it is actually air. But 16% of concrete is water. So that is a, uh, the primary source of water that we're talking about when we talk about moisture issues on job sites. So where does it come from? Well, obviously concrete, we said, is water plus cement. That gives you your water-cement ratio. The water-cement ratio largely determines the strength and durability of the concrete when it's cured properly. But what that also does, as you can see by the chart here, is that affects the time and days that it takes for that moisture to work its way through the system. So in this graph here, it gives you three examples uh, of a high uh, water-to-cement ratio of 0.8 all the way down to a low one of 0.4. And you can see how on day three, they started very high moisture emission rates. But over time, all three uh, ratios gradually start to wane down. By day 28, they're very close. Uh, by a year, they're basically emitting the same amount of moisture regardless of the WC ratio. But that does give you some idea early on in a project why moisture could be an issue. If you have someone, uh, a GC or an architect who specified a 0.8 WC ratio, on day three, it is emitting a lot of moisture. And we know uh, early on that one of the main concerns with the general contract or the builder is his schedule. So he wants to get uh, his installers, his contractors into projects as soon as possible. And everyone on the, on the call here being uh, flooring people, we realize that Sometimes our flooring contractors are pushed onto a job too soon, and that creates an issue with moisture. And this is a good little illustration here of why that is a problem early on in projects. So where does it come from? Uh, you have, in concrete, you have two, source, two sources of moisture. You have water of hydration. This is the actual water that's required uh, to complete the chemical reaction that allows concrete to cure. Typically, that's about 25% of the cement of weight. What that means is that moisture is actually used in the chemical reaction that causes the concrete to cure up. So that water of hydration typically is not part of the issue with uh, moisture problems. What is is that water of convenience. This is water used for the ease of workability and placement. So, for instance, uh, a higher content of water of convenience allows you to pump the cement up to multiple storied applications. If you have to get up to a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth floor to pour some cement, you have some water of convenience to make that product easier to transfer vertically. Uh, it also allows it, once it's poured out, it makes it uh, easier to move around, uh, to get into the places. So that water of convenience makes up another 25 to 40% of the cement by weight. That's a lot of water that has to exit the product and is not consumed in the actual chemical reaction of that cement curing out. So that's, that is water that has to leave through evaporation. There's no other way to leave. It's not going to get used in the chemical reaction, 
So it has to leave via evaporation. And that's why you have that waning scale. You saw a couple slides ago where it starts very high and then slowly starts to trickle off. Uh, from there, we can measure the, the moisture vapor transmission rate. This is where we measure that water of convenience evaporating out of the system. Uh, so it gives an example here of a four inch slab poured at a 0.5 water to cement ratio evaporates at about half a gallon per square foot. That's water coming up through the concrete um, and, and evaporating in, into, the, into the air. That's your, va your moisture vapor transmission rate or MVTR and that can be measured. And that's how we determine, okay, is this slab ready to be installed with the particular floor covering that's specified or is it still emitting too much moisture? So if you look at this uh, slide, this details uh, a couple of the sources of moisture. So to start with, we, let's start at the bottom where you have your water table. So obviously this is that on-grade slab where you are in contact with the soil underneath it. There is moisture that's in that water table that is going to try and obviously move up through evaporation. Typically what's specified on a project is a, water, is a uh, vapor barrier, which you see there in the middle of the slide. This barrier can help eliminate moisture from the ground, but has no effect on moisture within concrete, which can still damage floor. So typically that vapor barrier is installed to protect the finished floor from water coming up from the water table. The problem is that water vapor barrier is not always properly installed. Sometimes it's left out. Uh, I did commercial flooring uh, for a contractor for 10 years, and the joke we always had on a job site was the day the vapor barrier is installed, the concrete guy's walking around with golf spikes. The reason for that is a properly installed vapor barrier can sometimes cause issues on the concrete slab pour. It can cause that slab to curl or crown, uh, depending on the issue that's involved. So it's, it, it increases the difficulty of getting that concrete slab nice and flat when you have a properly installed vapor barrier. The best way I can explain this is if you take a sponge and you wet it, you saturate a sponge, and you put it out on your front lawn, you come back a day later and it's a dry, flat sponge because the water in that sponge was able to evaporate up, down, and through all four sides. If you take that same sponge and you saturate it and you put it on a porcelain tile or some type of non-porous substrate, and you come back a day later, that sponge will have dried, but it will have curled because it could only uh, water can only evaporate out of the top and sides. It cannot ev evaporate down because it was over top of a non-porous surface. So imagine the same thing with a concrete slab over top of a properly installed vapor barrier. The water of convenience can only go up, and sometimes that causes that slab to cure, uh, to cure curled, curled. Above that, you see your water of convenience. You see those droplets coming up and how that water of convenience can wreak havoc on your finished floor covering. It can cause bubbles, uh, which is a, a very common thing that you see in sheet goods. And it can cause seam failures also in sheet goods. Um, this you can also see around the edges of VCT tile, which we'll see in a little bit. But that is how you see visually how you see moisture creating problems with the finished flooring, bubbles and seam failures. Why do we test for moisture? Well, number one, we know that finished floor covering manufacturers have requirements, and then there's also industry standards required for installing finished goods. You see there, hardwood floors requires three pounds uh, on the calcium chloride and 75% relative humidity. VCT, you have a range there depending on the product, 75 to 90% relative humidity, three to seven pounds on the calcium chloride. So that's one of the reasons why. We know the flooring manufacturers require it. A lot of times also it's written into the project specifications where the architect or the designer is saying, listen, before you proceed with your finished flooring install, I want you to test the slab and I want you to submit the results. Um, that is a way for the architect to ensure that his product that he specifies is being installed correctly because he's writing into the specifications a moisture test. Also, obviously, to avoid potential contractual issues. Sometimes flooring contractors will write into their flooring contract that they will not install over top of a slab that is emitting too much moisture, and therefore they will test the slab for moisture, and they build that into their pricing sometimes. But obviously the number one reason we test for moisture is to avoid flooring problems. 
uh, with moisture, you get cupping, you get crowning, uh, you get curling of seams. You, you the, the key thing is you get adhesive breakdown. Uh, the, the adhesive will re-emulsify and no longer hold the flooring in place. You'll get bleed through at the seams. You see a lot of that with VCT adhesive, bleeding through at the seams. And in very, um, you know, your worst case, you have a complete release of the flooring material from the floor, which I've seen a number of times. Here you see some of the examples that we talk about. You see that cupping, that bridging in a solid hardwood floor. Uh, you see the bubbling in a sheet vinyl floor, especially now with the, uh, the influx and the increased use of heat weldable products, where you're essentially creating a seamless floor. That moisture has nowhere to go. It can't go through any visible seams like it could in VCT. It can't go through the fiber backings of a carpet. You have a seamless floor here that has uh, the moisture ha vapor has nowhere to go. So it creates these large bubbles where it literally lifts the flooring off of the slab. You see some peeling edges there of some LVT where it starts to delaminate. And then the last one there, you see VCT tile where it's highly polished and that moisture has nowhere to go. So it causes the edges of that VCT to cup and create those, um, uh, those deformities that you see there. So things to check on a job site. Uh, obviously, uh, there's things that the manufacturer requires that you check on a job site, whether it's the flatness of the floor, uh, you know, quarter inch and 10 feet or whatever that, that product requires as far as the flatness. Typically, they ask you to check for compressive strength. That's the Schmidt hammer test. That's where the flooring manufacturer or even the adhesive manufacturer will tell you that the substrate has to have a certain amount of compressive strength in order to properly bond. Uh, NWFA, I think, says 3,500 pounds of PSI in order to properly glue a wood floor to a substrate. That is how you test it with the Schmidt hammer test. Obviously, we want to check for moisture, which is what we're talking about today. And then a lot of times installers will also check for the porosity of the slab. That's a very good um, qualitative thing to check so you know uh, the type of adhesive you're going to use, but also the type of trowel you're going to use. A lot of the adhesives will tell you for a porous slab, use this trowel. For a non-porous substrate, use this trowel. So these are the types of things that contractors typically check, check for on a project before they start. And obviously, we're centering right there on that uh, moisture content. So how do you identify moisture content? How do you know if you have a problem? Uh, well, you have two types of tests. You have a qualitative test, and you have a quantitative test. The way I explain it is the qualitative test is a nice, quick test you can do to throw up some red flags and let you know, okay, we need to do some further testing here. You have plastic sheet tests, you have the matte bond test, and you have a pH test. Quantitative measure tests are tests that actually give you data that you can then compare with the flooring manufacturer or adhesive manufacturer to say, okay, these are the numbers I got from, from the test. The product I use can handle this. Do I need to do anything here to mitigate the moisture or I, am I within my limits? And those tests would be your calcium chloride test, your RH test, and your electrical impedance test. And all of these tests have ASTM uh, guidelines written for them so that the installer can know that he's doing it properly. This is just a quick example of a qualitative test, the plastic sheet test. You take a piece of plastic, you tape it down over top of the concrete, you come back a day or two later, and you check underneath that. Uh, plastic sheet. If you have a big giant wet spot like that or a lot of condensation on the underneath of that plastic sheet, that's a good flag that you may want to do some further moisture testing here because you have a slab that's still off-gassing. When you get into the quantitative test, this is, this is the more uh, scientific, data-driven type of testing. The first one is the calcium chloride. This used to be the industry standard years ago. Certainly when I was in commercial flooring, this was the industry standard. Um, I started right out of college uh, with a commercial flooring company, so I was the go for running out and placing a lot of these tests all over the place. It is a, qu a quantitative test, but what I like to say about the calcium chloride test is it really just gives you a snapshot of what that slab is doing over a 60 to 72 hour period. So while it is quantitative, it can, um, it can go up and down based on a, a myriad of, of 
potential reasons. The weather outside, is it raining? Did it rain the week before? Has it been a dry spell where there's been no rain? All these things can kind of uh, affect that calcium chloride test. But the rule of thumb is three tests for every 1,000 feet, one additional test for every 1,000 feet after that. And you get your results in pounds per 1,000 square feet. So you'll get three pounds per 1,000. You'll get seven pounds, nine, 12. Uh, the application is fairly simple. You have a disc there filled with calcium chloride. You weigh it before the test. You weigh it after the test. And a whole series of equations will give you your final uh, number that then you can compare with the finished goods that you're putting down. Uh, the, the more highly accepted in the industry method of testing moisture has been, has turned to the relative humidity test. The reason for that is that you can get a snapshot, but you can get it constantly over a long range of time. Uh, you drill down into the slab, you place your probe, uh, down in there that measures the relative humidity, and then you can get a reading uh, with either a uh, sort of a pen that you can stick down to a probe. There's probes now that you can get readings on your phone if you're close by. The nice thing about the probes is you can skim over top of it. You can finish your flooring, and if there's ever a reason or an issue, you can go back there and you can continue to get results off of that probe that's embedded in the slab. So this has really become uh, what I've seen, this has sort of become the industry standard for testing moisture out there. Again, three probes for every thousand, for your first thousand square feet, one probe for every additional thousand square feet after that, and the results you get are in a percentage, so 75% relative humidity, 85% relative humidity, 90, et cetera. Next, you have the electrical impedance test. This would be uh, like the Tramex, where you place um, this, this product over top of your slab, you press down, and that sort of initiates the test where the electrodes are coming in contact with the slab, and you get an immediate result. So you don't have to wait 72 or 60 hours. You get an immediate result in percentage, and it'll tell you roughly uh, the, the moisture that's being emitted from the slab. While this is a quantitative moisture test, again, you're getting it basically reading for that second. So if it's a high, humid day or you have recently rained, it, it might skew some of your numbers, but it does give you hard numbers that then can give you an idea, okay, you know, this is uh, showing 8% on the Tramex. I know I have a potential moisture test or moisture problem here. I should probably do some further testing before I come back and install any floor covering. Uh, eight tests for the first 1,000 square feet, at least five for every 1,000 square feet after that. Again, the nice part about the Tramex it does give you that instant, um, that instant uh, data point. So once you've got your moisture readings and you know, okay, uh, I, I have a, a slab that's emitting 95% relative humidity. I know my flooring requires 90. I have a problem. Uh, I cannot install over this slab it's non-compliant, and I will void my warranty. So I know I have a moisture issue. What am I going to do to solve it? Well, typically, if it's early on in the schedule, you're not due in for a number of weeks, the general contractor may tell you, okay, well, I don't need you for another three weeks. Let's just let the slab be, let it continue to off-gas, and let's wait until we get a little bit closer to the install date, and we'll decide what we want to do. Or you may go to the contractor and you say, listen, I have a non-compliant slab. It's emitting too much moisture. You need me in here next week. I'm telling you I cannot be in here. I'll void the warranty on my finished flooring. At that point now, the GC has, an, uh, uh, has a dilemma. Obviously, he can't um, push his schedule out. There's probably liquidated damages at the end of the job that he needs to concern himself with if he doesn't turn it over on a due date. So he's going to come to the flooring contractor. Again, this is the best case scenario and say, okay, what are my options here to mitigate this product? or to mitigate this problem? Um, what are my options to be able to handle that moisture and have it not affect my schedule? So at that point, you have several options. You have some reactive penetrance. You have high-performance adhesives that we'll talk about a little bit. You have rolled moisture barriers. Uh, you have all-in-one adhesives, which is uh, the wood version of high-performance adhesives. And then you have epoxies. When you talk about moisture, the key 
thing to talk about is the perm rating. Okay, so there's all types of products out there that claim to be able to handle moisture. Uh, this is a high moisture adhesive, or this is a moisture retarder, or this is a moisture vapor barrier. All of that relates to what's called perm rating, or the permeability of what you're installing. And the permeability is how much of the moisture does it still allow through even though you've applied the product down. So if you look at a, moisture, a perm rating of one, that's essentially bare concrete. So if you put down nothing over top of the concrete, it has a perm rating of one. Everything then goes down from there. The numbers get smaller as your perm rating gets better. When you go all the way to zero, that's full protection. So literally there's no way any moisture vapor could, could penetrate through that slab and affect the flooring that's above it. So in 2006, you had the International Residential Code that set the vapor retarding as anywhere from one down to 0.15. And then the NWFA recommends an impermeable vapor retarder, or what they call a vapor barrier, which would then go from 0.5 down to as close to zero as possible. So those are sort of your two ranges for products that could pr protect your finished goods from moisture. You have the vapor retarders and you have the vapor barriers. So that's important when you go to look at these products is not so much saying, okay, this product says it can handle 95% relative humidity, or this product says it can handle eight pounds of, uh, of moisture vapor emissions on the calcium chloride test. The key thing to look at is, does the product give its perm rating? Because once you know its perm rating, you'll know where it fits on this scale as being a vapor retarder or a vapor barrier. So the first one we talked about was reactive penetrance. Uh, these reduce moisture transfer from the slab by reducing the surface porosity. So these are products that get installed, uh, troweled over the surface of the slab, closes up the pores, so it almost tightens the slab up, and that uh, reduces the amount of moisture that can come up. Uh, it's capable of penetrating down into the concrete, so it goes down, usually uh, several sixteenths of an inch down into the concrete, closes up the pores, and reduces the amount of moisture that can then come through the slab. The reactive penetrance must not be over-applied. Uh, it takes sufficient time for this chemical reaction to take place and for those pores to close up. And over-applying can create a film that can adversely affect adhesion. So the problem with some of those reactive penetrances is if they're not installed exactly perfectly, they leave a film that now you've created another problem. So you've solved the problem with the moisture, well, you've created a problem because now your adhesive won't stick to it, which is why these reactive penetrants, typically for a slab that is going to be covered with finished goods, they typically don't like to use these reactive penetrants because it can affect the adhesion. We talked earlier about high-performance adhesive. Uh, you'll see a lot of products out there, whether it's VCT glue, carpet tile glue, uh, LVT adhesives, multipurpose adhesives for sheet vinyl and everything else that are called high performance or high moisture technology, or they say, okay, this, uh, this VCT glue can handle up to 10 pounds on the calcium chloride or 95% on the relative humidity. And we know from earlier that the VCT requires a much lower moisture content. What the adhesive manufacturers are saying is, we can handle moisture as long as it's on a waning scale. So typically these adhesives are good for new slabs, green slabs, and slabs that have a properly installed vapor barrier. And we sort of talked earlier about how often a vapor barrier is installed properly, not, not too often, unfortunately. So these, these adhesives, while they're good, they are designed for a slab that has waning uh, levels of moisture, so new slabs. You would not want to use these high moisture adhesives on a slab that is, say, 20 or 30 years old, but is still emitting 95% relative humidity. You know that that is not a waning slab. That's not gradually going down. If it's 20 years old, it's done doing what it's doing, and that 95% relative humidity is coming from somewhere else besides the slab. It's coming from a water table. It's coming from something on the facade. It's coming from another source other than the water of convenience that we talked about all the way back in the beginning. So while these high-performance adhesives are very good, just keep in mind, it's for a waning uh, moisture level in a slab, so for new concrete, new construction. 
You also have these rolled moisture barriers. These are membranes utilized uh, with fabric. They create a buffer, uh, almost like a slip sheet, um, that keeps the moisture coming up from the slab from affecting your finished goods. But they are rolled products. They do have seams, and I would um, hesitate and, and make sure everyone checks on these rolled moisture barriers the perm rating, because uh, I think you'll find that a lot of them uh, fall more into the retarder and less into the barrier aspect of it. Uh, but this is another way that, that installers are out there solving moisture problems out on job sites. All in one adhesives are popular on the wood side of the business. Uh, these create a membrane. You require a specific trowel, and they keep the moisture in the subfloor. So if you look at this flooring, uh, the picture is, um, I wish I had a better picture of it, but typically these type of all in one adhesives are installed with a trowel that has, um, a small raised nipple every couple inches on the trowel. And what that does is it raises the teeth of the trowel off of the concrete so that when you actually spread your adhesive, you're putting down a monolithic layer of polyurethane. And you only have a very, very small bit of exposed um, concrete, basically everywhere that nipple is on the, on, the, on the trowel, that's the only place you have any exposed concrete. And because you're putting down a monolithic layer of adhesive plus your ridges, that small area of exposed concrete gets covered once you place the board and properly embed it into the adhesive. So these all-in-one adhesives are very popular on the wood side because they can handle, uh, essentially most of the, the, the better selling ones can handle unlimited moisture. The last option is epoxies. Uh, these will create a membrane by penetrating down into the subfloor and embedding the moisture inside. Uh, it's the most common uh, moisture mitigation option that's been used. It's been around the longest and has the best proven track record. Uh, what you see there in the picture is a gentleman installing it. It's typically a rolled-on application. Some of them are troweled applied. Some of them are squeegee applied. Uh, but the finished product typically on these epoxies is almost like a mirror-like finish on the concrete. And what I like to tell people is with, with these epoxies, it's really almost like hitting the reset button on your slab. And I'll get into that in a little bit. So those are the, those are the methods that moisture is addressed on, the pro, on a project anytime you have a problem. You have these penetrators. You have these high moisture technology adhesives. Um, you have roll-on products. You have the all-in-ones. You have the epoxies. What we're going to talk today specifically about is the epoxies and specifically the epoxies that Sika uh, sells and markets into the floor covering industry. So the first slide here shows that perm rating scale that I showed you earlier. Uh, it does show uh, a couple different products here. What I want to focus on first is that, that first box there where it says Sika Bond T21 and Sika Bond T100. These are, if I go back, these are these all-in-one adhesives that I talked about. So these are adhesives that you put down with a special trowel. You lay that monolithic layer of uh, polyurethane or hybrid adhesive, and that's what gives you your, your moisture resistance. And I say resistance because that's what it fits into. It fits into the vapor retarding scale. Uh, the Sikabon T21 and the T100 have a perm rating of about a 0.4, uh, which is very good uh, in the all-in-one category. But what I show you then is next to it, the Sika MB and the Sika MB red line, which we're going to get into in depth, those have a 0 0.06 firm rating. And again, I said earlier, the zero is a full protection. So that's as close to full protection as you can get uh, without having a completely non-permeable substrate, which is very difficult to obtain. But that 0.6 puts it now into the vapor barrier category. So when you talk about moisture protection, like I said earlier, you're talking about retarding the moisture and you're talking about actually putting down a barrier that prevents the moisture from coming up. And that's what the MB and the MB red line does. Super low permeability and high moisture protection. So the first product is the Sika MB primer. It's a moisture barrier, substrate consolidator, and adhesion promoter. That's important. Uh, when I talk about this product and I show it to contractors, I show it to installers, I want to make sure they know it's not just for moisture protection, although that, that is what it excels at. It also does a tremendous job of consolidating substrates. So if you have a loose 
uh, frail bowl top to your concrete or a real powdery gypcrete pour uh, that you know you can take your key and dig right into and you know it does not have the compressor strength needed for the pouring uh, that you're putting over top of it. The MB does a tremendous job of consolidating that slab, consolidating that gypcrete. Uh, when it cures out, it has a PSI of around 10,000 PSI, which is about three, uh, two and a half, three times the compressive strength of a concrete slab. So it's going to give you the compressive strength needed to install any type of finished finish floor covering over top of it. Also, adhesion promoter. That's important because we know a lot of times we're going on to these jobs that have moisture problems. A lot of times it's a rehab or a retrofit where you're ripping up an existing floor and you're coming down and installing a new floor over top of it. One of the biggest problems that you have in that instance, if you have moisture, is before you can install any of these moisture protection products, you need to remove 100% of that existing adhesive, whether it's old cutback, whether it's old uh, clear thin spread, VCT adhesive, or carpet tile adhesive. Uh, a lot of the competitive two-part epoxies out there in the market require you to remove all of that adhesive. FICA only asks you to remove 50% of it because of that adhesive promotion that you see there on the bullet point. If you remove 50% of that adhesive, and I usually tell contractors rule of thumb is anything larger than the size of your fist, you want to keep sanding or grinding, uh, scarifying, whatever you're using to, to take up that adhesive, you want to keep at it until these blotches, for lack of a better term, are smaller than the size of your fist. But what it'll do, because it penetrates down into the slab about 3 sixteenths of an inch, it'll encapsulate that remaining 50% of the adhesive, and even if that adhesive were to lift or remove from the substrate, it will not affect your moisture barrier at all, and therefore will not affect your finished flooring. It has super low permeability that you saw on the slab before, 0 .6, 0 0.06 on the perm rating. It's a two-component, solvent-free, viscosity uh, epoxy primer for use under all floors. Uh, it can handle up to 6% on the Tremax, 25% on calcium chloride, 100% relative humidity. So short of standing water or puddles on your slab, this will handle any moisture vapor coming through that, that uh, concrete. Here you see a picture of it installed. You see that mirror-like finish that I referred to. The uh, Sika MB primer cures out in a dark blue color. This way you can see all the areas that you've hit. It's a single coat. So unlike some of the competitors that say, okay, you got to hit it with one coat, come back again and hit it with a second coat in a couple hours, this is a single coat that can handle up to 100% relative humidity. It cures in about six to, six to eight hours, depending on the temperature. Uh, and once it's cured, you're ready for finished floor, you're ready to do your finished floor prep over top of it. The red line is sort of the sister product to the MB primer. The red line does everything the MB does, but what it does is it adds speed to the process. Where I said the Seek MB cures in six to eight hours, this product cures in three hours. It has the same low permeability, same two component process, which you'll see in a little bit, solvent free, low viscosity and it handles all the same moisture levels, again, short of standing water, as the MB primer. The key to this product is you pick up speed. You basically cut your cure time in half. So if you have product projects like hospital work, where you're doing MRI rooms or ER rooms or patient rooms, <clears throat> time is of the essence. Uh, we know how much dollars those rooms generate in an hour. So if you can, if you can release that room to be used again as an MRI room three hours quicker than you can using the MB, it's a huge benefit to the end user and they're willing to pay a couple cents more square foot to make that happen. Also big for retail, uh, mall work, we have the MB red line specified now. We're doing Walmarts with it because they take, um, you know, every if they're doing a, um, a refit of a Walmart where they're replacing the flooring, typically they'll go in They'll rip out two or three aisles of floor covering, and then they want it done and, and ready to go in, in, as quickly as possible because they can't have the aisles shut down. So this product is, is specified a lot on those type of applications. Grocery stores as well. Uh, I'm involved with a grocery store out in the Midwest. 
that is using this product because the same thing. They, they can't be shut down. They can't have aisles shut down for an uh, extended period of time, so they need to get on top of it as quickly as possible. Here you see the red line cured out. It has a red color, obviously. Again, single coat, single, uh, single coat application. You get the full moisture protection with one coat of this. Uh, you get uh, anywhere between 250 to 300 square feet out of a unit. Uh, I usually tell people when they're figuring jobs, I usually tell them to work around the mid-level of it, around 300 square feet. But obviously, it's based on the porosity of the slab, but also on the surface, uh, the, the profile of the slab. You have a slab that's just really beat up, has exposed aggregate. Obviously, you're, you're going to lose a lot of your coverage. If you have a, you know, a CSP of one, you know, or, or even a little bit higher, like a broom finish, you're going to be able to stretch that a little bit because you're not gobbling up as much of that material with a rough surface. This is the packaging for both the MB and the MB Redline. This is different than a lot of the competitors. A lot of the competitors that have two-part epoxies, they give you two components. And I can tell you from a company I used to work for, we had a two-part epoxy, and I can, I can tell you I went on to about five or six claims where they said the product didn't work, and I went out to the job site, and I'm walking the job site in the closet, I find four part Bs. And I say, well, where's the part A? Well, that's just extra part Bs we have. Well, you, in a two-part system, you never have extra of one of the parts. You know immediately you have a problem if you have an extra part B laying around somewhere. What's nice about the Sika system is you pop the lid. The first thing sitting on top there in that tray is your part B. So you take that gallon out, you take the tray out, you put the gallon of the Part B right into the mix, and you're off and running. This way you can ensure you're not going to have any leftover boxes of Part B that are hidden in the closet that the installer couldn't find, so we just laid down the Part A. So, again, here's the Seek MB, Seek MB Redline. I do have a video. Lizzie, if you can push it, you can, uh, you can show some of the, uh, the video here. That would be great.
From moisture protection to subfloor correction, Sika has one goal. To make your floors Sika secure. Okay, that's the video. Um, I hope everyone was able to see sort of how the product is applied, how it's mixed, uh, the ease of application. Again, they just use a 3 8 inch nap roller there uh, and just roll the product out. Typically what we tell installers to do is to uh, tape off about 300 square feet so that they can see sort of the spread rate, they can see the thickness of the film they're laying down, and once they get comfortable with it, they have a better idea of how the spread rate is. They don't need to keep taping off 300 square feet. Um, but that's a good guideline. Or I've seen some guys who just put pencil marks on the wall so they know, okay, I got to paint up to here, and I know I, I got my proper spread rate. Uh, it's, it's a very easy product to use. Again, six-hour cure for the MB, three-hour cure for the red line, and you're able to handle 100% relative humidity. So again, to wrap up, uh, the keys to moisture, obviously check the floor covering manufacturer's requirements. Make sure that, that whatever you are installing, that the slab is emitting the proper amount of moisture. And if it's too high, you know what to do. Check the compressor strength uh, that with that Schmidt hammer test. That's something that I don't see enough guys doing out in the field. You need to make sure that that slab has the proper compressor strength for whatever you're installing. Check the moisture content. We went over all the different ways to do that, whether it's the calcium chloride, the relative humidity, the Tramex, even the qualitative ones where you just tape down some plastic to give yourself a, at least an idea if there's a red flag. And check the porosity of the slab. The reason I have that there is because the best thing, in my opinion, about the Seek MB and the Seek MB Redline is the minimal amount of prep that's required. A lot of the competitive products out there will tell you you have to bead blast that slab. If it's too highly burnished, you need to bead blast the slab. If you have old adhesive, you need to bead blast the slab. Bead blast the slab. We know that that's a huge cost uh, that's associated on a job site is bead blasting. And one of the nice things with the Seek MB is you do not always have to bead blast. The only thing we ask you to do, if you have old adhesive, take up 50% of it. A lot of times that can be done by scraping or scarifying. Much easier and less expensive than bead blasting. The other thing we tell you to do is just make sure the slab's porous. So when you go to do your test, or when you go to do your job walkthrough and you're testing the compressor strength and you're checking the flatness of the floor and you're doing your moisture testing, drop a couple droplets of water on the slab. If that water sucks in within 60 seconds, you know you have a porous substrate and you do not need to bead blast. If it sits on top of that slab, like it's sitting on top of your car windshield and you come back two, three, four minutes later and it's just sitting there, you know you have a very, very aggressive sealer on that slab that you're going to have to remove. But short of that, all we ask is porous slab and 50% of old adhesive to be removed. Very, very user-friendly, low-prep product to get the benefits of 100% relative humidity. So if you hesitate with the time and the cost involved in the testing of the solution, we have some one simple question. Can you afford the floor to fail? And that's the key. And that's something that I've had to sit in front of general contractors and explain architects and explain and users and explain because we understand that moisture mitigation is not an inexpensive change order and you get a lot of pushback on it in the field from the people that you're dealing with but the question i always say is is it is it cheaper to pay this addendum or this change order or is it cheaper to reinstall this floor three months from now when you have all the furniture on top of it if it's a hostel you have all the beds you have all the medical equipment Everything that a school, you have all the desks. I mean, everything that factors into replacing a floor, it far exceeds the cost of using a moisture mitigation system. Um, so while, yes, it's a difficult change order for a lot of general contractors to stomach and a lot of architects to sign off on, when they see the cost of replacing the floor and they understand the mechanics of it and the reason it has to be done, uh, we have a, a very good success rate of getting products like this onto job sites. Uh, and obviously bringing in the manufacturer's rep, someone like me, to help explain that is just more bullets uh, to go out there and try and make sure that you're able to get these types of products pushed through on jobs, accepted on jobs, 
and most importantly, paid to install them on jobs. Any questions at all about the SECA system, uh, moisture mitigation in general, moisture concerns in general, anything I can help out with, obviously the floor is open. John, thanks so much for that presentation. That was very interesting. We do have one question ready to go. Um, how long can MP or Redline be exposed before covering it with flooring? Okay, so both of these products, um, they have a 36-hour window. So what that means is, say, let's take the uh, MB primer as, a, as an example. We know that that's going to cure out in six to eight hours. Once it's fully cured at six to eight hours, you have 36 hours of time in which to install your, your finished goods over top of it. We know a lot of times that doesn't happen. Maybe it gets put down on a Friday. They plan on coming back uh, on Monday. Well, you, you, you've exceeded that 36 hours. The solution there is fairly simple. You do a, a light screening or light sanding of the product, nothing aggressive. Uh, what you're doing there is just opening it up a little bit. And then you do an acetone wipe. And what the acetone wipe does, what acetone does really with any epoxy is it sort of reactivates it. It makes it tacky again. It makes it a little bit sticky. Uh, and once you do that uh, light screening and acetone wipe, you basically reset that 36-hour window again. So that gives you another 36 hours to install over top of it. What I would say is that the product is not a wear layer. So you don't want to leave it exposed too long, especially if it's on a commercial site where you have multiple trades working in the same room. Maybe you got electricians, you got guys working on the ceiling, you got a painter. So the more foot traffic you have over top of that, the more you're going to have to sort of clean it and get it ready again to put your floor covering down. So obviously you want to, you want to get in there as early in that window as possible, but you do have 36 hours <clears throat> that you can install over top of it before you need to do that, that light screen and acetone wipe. mentioned that there was some additional surface preparation needed after the MB primer or the red line cures? Yes. So after the red line or MB has cured, if there's any additional prep required, that's typically driven by the type of floor that's being installed. And by that, I mean, okay, so let's say that we're installing hardwood flooring over top of it. We're going to glue down hardwood floors. You can use any of the Sika polyurethanes or the Sika hybrids, you can bond directly to that MB or that MB red line. So you would need no additional surface prep uh, required if you're gluing down wood with a urethane or a hybrid to the MB or the MB red line. You can also use any kind of pressure sensitive adhesives, for instance, uh, carpet tile adhesives. You can um, go directly over top of this. The only thing it would affect is it would extend your tack time. So if you're if your adhesive normally took a half hour to 40 minutes to tack up to be ready to put down your carpet tile, it might extend that out to about an hour because, again, that adhesive only has one direction to off-gas, and that's up. Uh, other types of adhesives, like water-based adhesives, or more importantly, finished floors that are very, very touchy as far as floor prep. So, for instance, LVT, VCT, where you have very um, – that surface prep that surface needs to be perfectly smooth or as smooth as you can get it, you'll want to prep over top of the MB. When you do that, and I have some additional slides here, you have a, an additional step where you prime the top of the MB with what's called an O2EZ primer. It's a single component, but it has some aggregate that's suspended in it. So when this cures out, it, gives, uh, it, it, it puts a texture onto the MB uh, it's fast drying. It'll dry in about, uh, we have 15 to 60 minutes here. That depends on the temperature and humidity. I've never applied this where it's dried in less than 20 minutes. So it's uh, longer than 20 minutes. So it's an incredibly fast drying primer. Once you have it primed, that's, that's some uh, installers applying the primer there. You just apply it with the same 3 8 inch nap roller uh, that you install the MB with. Then you can put a cementitious coat over top of it, whether it's a skim coat or a self-leveler. So what you've done now is you've reintroduced cement into the equation. And the reason that's good is because a lot of those products I talked about, whether it's LVT or um, solid vinyl plank or VCT, those adhesives are water-based adhesives, and they require the water to evaporate out of them. 
And because we're now reintroducing cement, we've given it that smooth finish that you need so you don't get any of those imperfections coming through and telegraphing through your floor. But we've also reintroduced the cement to allow the adhesive to tack up properly. Uh, we know typically VCT adhesive takes about 45 minutes to tack up before you can go into it. If you were to put that VCT adhesive directly over top of the MB or the MB red line, it, that would extend that significantly longer before you, it would tack up to the point that you could install VCT. So this gives you that window now that you can install VCT, and it gives you that smooth surface so that you don't have any imperfections uh, over uh, that telegraph through the finished flooring. And again, if you look at the Sika product ranges, you can see there the self-levelers and patches, all those types of products can be installed over top of the MB as long as you prime it first with the O2EZ. Wow, great. It all works together. Yeah, it's awesome. Sika definitely promotes the definitely promotes this this the the Sika secure system. So we want to be able to provide protection from the top to the bottom. Uh, so all these products in conjunction with one another. Uh, can give you some some very good warranties out there on commercial or residential projects. Great. Well, I do not have any other questions um, coming in or waiting here, uh, so I think we'll wrap it up now. Um, so on behalf of Great. SDICA, thank you so much, Sean, for presenting today's webinar, sponsored by Sika Corporation. Um, so certified installation managers who attended this webinar on the education platform can now navigate to their education credit profile and submit their credit. And if you are looking for any other continuing education opportunities, you can access previous webinars by navigating to the Courses section and clicking the On Demand button. Uh, we also have a training resources page on the FCICA website for other offerings. And thank you so much for joining us today. And again, thank you for your patience at the beginning um, with our notification delay. And uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day.